Hello and welcome to today's webinar. On behalf of Intelligent Transport, Cubic and Moveit, I'd like to thank you all for attending today. I'm your moderator, Sam Emmett, Junior Editor of Intelligent Transport. Today's speakers will be Robert Sprogis, Product Unit Senior, Senior Director at Cuba Interactive, Frank Kopaz, Vice President of Worldwide, Worldwide Sales at Moveit, Bonnie Crawford, Senior Product Unit Director at Cubic Next App. Following today's presentations, we will move on to a live question and answer session where you can pose questions to today's speakers. Please remember, you can submit questions at any point during the webinar using the questions panel situated in the menu on the right. So without hesitation, I will pass you over to Bonnie Crawford to talk a bit about the global view of transportation recovery to begin. Thank you, Sam. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I know that uh, we're all very excited to be here talking about this important topic. And um, this is something that we uniquely are dealing with around the world. And one of the things that we're gonna be talking about today is how do we bring those riders back to public transport? What we're going to look at is some really um, interesting data that we've collected, not just from our own data, but also from a number of open data sources such as Google and Apple. And we're going to really be digging into how private vehicle transport, active mobility, and then public transport has been responding to this global crisis that we are working through around the world. As we start to look at some of the trends around North America, continental Europe, Oceania, and developing Asia, one of the things that we're starting to see is that as each of those regions has moved through the COVID crisis, we're getting a lot of data that's showing uh, that we're seeing recovery in different parts of the world, and certainly some parts of the globe are recovering um, at different trends and times. And I think that um, some of that is actually been quite surprising as we've looked at the, the data trends. So we're going to dig in here um, and start with Asia. One of the things I think we've found, um, and if you look at the data on your screen, you can see that the pink uh, automobile is your private vehicles, uh, the orange line is your active mobility, and then the purple is your public transport. Um, given the high level of social compliance, um, the strict adherence to social distancing and mask wearing, um, we've seen a almost uh, complete recovery in the public transport section specifically in places like Tokyo. Um, and as those regions have started to recover, um, you can see that we're almost back to the baseline um, from pre-COVID as they've started to reopen their cities. Now, one of the things that's interesting as we move on to Europe, um, and I wanna specifically zero in here on Paris, is that um, as that recovery has started to happen, we are seeing um, that certainly they have a higher reliance on public transport in many of the cities um, than we do perhaps in other places like North America or uh, Latin America, for example. But Paris has done a tremendous job at really focusing on restricting congestion. And so as people have moved back towards public transit there, um, we're really seeing that, um, that there is a, a number of incentives that they've put into place to keep those um, congestion uh, levels down. And I think that that's something that we're going to dig into as we get a little further into the discussion this afternoon around how we can bring riders back across the board and across the world. So if we dig in over here into North America, um, as an American, I can say that uh, we haven't done the best job uh, at handling the crisis. And, um, you know, I think that one of the things that's interesting, certainly we have a higher rate of private vehicle ownership and as safety has become a fairly critical concern around the world, but certainly here in the States, um, as we haven't had quite the uh, recovery effort that some of the um, colleagues that we, we work with around the world have experienced. Um, an article yesterday in the Chicago uh, Tribune 
called out the fact that the essential workers that are utilizing public transport around the world, and certainly here in North America, um, that this is really the backbone of our society and that doing things like incentivizing their ridership, um, putting in place social distancing measures and giving them real-time passenger information to help make safer decisions are all things that we're gonna dig into as we get a little further into our discussion today. Uh, but certainly we do have work to do here in the States and um, we're, we're seeing the baseline recovery happen at a much slower pace than some of the other regions. As we get on to um, Oceana, um, one of the things that we're seeing is, although we, we have started to see that recovery um, in places like New Zealand, and others. Um, they have great contact tracing, um, private vehicles are certainly outpacing transit, but we are starting to see that transit recovery, and that's definitely encouraging. Now, following uh, the digging into some of the data, and this is, data is available um, on Google and Apple, um, there are a variety of sources, and we're really looking at how we can collaborate with um, our data as well as more of an open data um, schema. But one of the things that I think we want to dig into now is how can we start to really build back that trust in public transport? We can see what the data is telling us, but there are a variety of things that I think we really want to have a better understanding and awareness. And to start that discussion and to really zero in on some of the topics um, that are important to you all who've joined us today, I think we're going to move on to our first poll. So you all should be getting a poll uh, window up on your screen, and we'd really like to understand where you're focusing your efforts today on influencing those people to return back to transport. So you'll have about 30 to 40 seconds to complete the poll, and once we've uh, gotten the results in, I'll share those with all of you. Wonderful, thank you all for participating in that. So um, with 56% and the, the highest percentage of responses, we do have fleet cleanliness and capacity planning for social distancing as uh, the primary area of concern. Um, we also have 42% of the participants who've said better and more frequent information is something that's very important to them. With touchless fare payment validation and inspection uh, at 38% of the responses. And then finally, rewards and incentives to increase transport usage with 24% of the responses today. So thank you all for participating um, in our first poll and um, we will share those results out um, on a broader scale as we get um, on to our next topic. Um, so before I hand it off to my colleague, we're going to move on here to the next slide. And I wanna talk briefly about the tremendous partnership that uh, we at Cubic have recently um, put into place with our partners at Move It as we bring together uh, public transport, uh, payment technologies with the leading mass um, provider for uh, journey planning and communication around the world. I lead the effort here at Cubic for bringing all of those technologies together into our newest mobile application. And I'm very excited to be able to start to put in place some of the pieces of um, information that you all just mentioned um, in your poll. How do we um, do better social distancing? How do we put passenger information into um, the hands of your riders to get them back onto transport? So I'm excited to hand the reins of our webinar this morning um, over to Frank Kopis, and um, he'll talk more about how we can bring those riders back to public transport. Thank you. Great. Great, thank you, Bonnie, and hello to everyone. Uh, we really appreciate you joining the session today. I just wanna make a couple of comments based on what Bonnie mentioned and share my perspective. We're very excited about the partnership with Cubic. We believe it's going to empower public transit riders with the ability to plan journeys that are optimized for cost, trip duration with filtered modes of transportation and pay for that journey too, all within a single platform. 
Um, and Move It, this is very much aligned with our focus as a company to simplify and improve the experience for riders by providing them with all possible mobility options to get from point A to point B. Um, when you've got several options, you can choose the best trip plan and there's and it allows you to think about what's best for me in terms of duration, affordability, and convenience. I think one of the you know interesting things that this offers is the ability to have our own personal preferences incorporated you know into a platform and to use a platform that understands this and adapts over time to travel uh, to tailor your travel experience. So um, all of this is really geared towards helping riders use public transportation, bring them back, uh, move them away from using private cars and, and bring a highly differentiated public uh, transit experience to, to bear. So uh, with that, I would like to go ahead and give you a little bit of background. Uh, one second here on the slides, okay. Great, okay, so quick background on Move It. Uh, we're a leader in mobility as a service and maker of the world's number one urban mobility app. Uh, we were just acquired in May by Intel to join forces with Mobileye to advance our mobility as a service strategy and accelerate our joint focus on driving global adoption of autonomous vehicles. A little bit more uh, background for you here. Sorry for the slide advancement there. Um, our mobile app guides people in getting around town effectively and conveniently using any mode of transport. It's all built on the foundation of public transportation. We were formed in 2012 and we're now approaching a billion users globally of our urban mobility app, which is used in 3,200 cities across 104 countries. And we collect a lot of data. So um, on a daily basis, we're collecting more than 6 billion data points about traffic flow, and user demand that we use to help cities and agencies for various transportation planning and mobility initiatives. Now, taking a look at trends, during June and July, we surveyed our app users in different countries all over the world with the objective to learn firsthand the evolution of urban mobility trends and habits due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we found that three important factors, or the three most important actually in, in gaining riders' trust are one, the ability to maintain social distancing on board and while waiting at stations, which I, I found very interesting. Uh, second, the need for reliable real-time data on arrivals, crowdedness, schedule, route changes. And then finally, the ability to pay through mobile devices to reduce unneeded contact. So taking a look at the US for a moment, and you see the question here. So we asked our riders, what would encourage you to use public transportation more in the US, okay? And you can see that we looked at four cities, Chicago, New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, and DC. Passengers in these cities want more frequent buses and trains and social distancing protocols to prevent overcrowding as well as real-time uh, arrival information. A significant amount of them also want touchless payment systems. Now moving to Europe, first starting in Berlin, we see that social distancing is their main concern. Riders would like to see more vehicles with limited passengers to keep safe. And also, again, knowing the real-time arrival information and the capacity in advance is another way to manage social distancing. And then finally, you know, contactless payments we continued to see was a bit less of a need in winning riders' trust back, but still on the radar, nearly 20%. Taking a look at Paris for a moment, so you can see that social distancing here is also a, a very big concern as well as passengers wanting more vehicles with limited numbers of riders to keep safe. And again, real-time information. Another interesting one, the ability to pre-book rides, uh, which is a growing trend. And then also having very precise service information, our, our key needs, Parisians indicated, uh, is relevant to winning their ridership back. One more for you, uh, looking at 
Melbourne, Australia. In Melbourne, we see very similar trends to what we saw in the US. Pretty high results here, actually. Real-time information, again, social distancing, higher frequency of vehicles. So you see kind of the common themes. Also, a pretty large percentage of contactless mobile payment systems. So, you know, just want to summarize here and make a few points. This slide shows a few of the areas that we have moved are working on with transit authorities to rebuild riders' trust. We believe it's very important that as cities around the world enter into this new normal, that they leverage data, communications tools in order to serve their riders effectively while keeping them and also their employees safe. And these solutions, we believe, should lie at the intersection of technological innovation, real-time communication, and mobility analytics, which are exactly the areas that we're focusing on. So we're constantly working to help find new ways to improve and adapt our services to keep people safe. Uh, with that, I would like to move into our next poll. So if all of you can please take a moment. And the question is, are you considering a mobile first strategy to passenger engagement and incentives? If you could go ahead and please indicate your selection from one of the four, that would be great. Okay, great. So first, let's take a look here. There's a fair amount not yet thinking about mobile first strategy, something that, that you might wanna consider uh, maybe some lessons learned from today. About 20% are exploring implementation in the next six months and overall about 40% in the next 12 months. So it looks like pretty active overall in terms of the audience here today looking at mobile first. And then there's 11% of this group already with a mobile engagement and incentive program. Great, thank you everybody for, uh, for taking the time to share your thoughts on that. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Robert Sprogis and appreciate your time so far today. Thank you very much, Frank. Good day, everybody. My name is Robert Sprogis and I am the head of Cubic Interactive. Cubic Interactive is Cubic's loyalty rewards, incentivization and content management sponsor platform. We've intentionally designed Cubic Interactive to be completely agnostic of Cubic, which is a great way of saying we can work with any transit agency anywhere in the world. Uh, our APIs and SDKs do not require Cubic's back offices, mobile apps, uh, validators. Effectively, we want to have a platform that really can help any transit agency who wishes to implement a rewards and loyalty incentivization program, which is really the core of what Cubic Interactive is. However, as is with every loyalty points and loyalty rewards solution in the world, there is a financial cost associated with issuing out a loyalty point. If you earn a loyalty point from Marriott or American Airlines or British Airways, that loyalty point has a financial burden, a financial liability to the issuing party. Much like if a loyalty program would be issued out from a transit agency and you would be able to redeem that loyalty point for a ticket or free fare value, that point will come at a cost. Cubic Interactive's sponsorship content solution that augments our incentivizations and rewards platform allows for us to create a offering that can create a cost neutral solution, a cost neutral loyalty rewards platform for any transit agency anywhere in the world, which effectively means we can offer Cubic Interactive at a net neutral cost point for transit agencies, or as is the case of Miami, we can actually offer Cubic Interactive as a potential revenue driver, an opportunity for transit agencies to make money off of Cubic Interactive, which is a nice little bit of a segue for us into Miami. Cubic Interactive is live in Miami. We launched in January. The data that you see up on this screen is a snapshot between January and March of this year. The United States was hit pretty hard by COVID in March. Transit authorities pretty much shut down. Uh, Cubic Interactive is still live in Miami. We're still generating revenue for Miami and the Miami transit system, but I figured I'd show you some data points as to what occurred in Miami pre-COVID. In Miami, what we have deployed is the full suite of Cubic Interactive 
our entire platform, if you will, where they have our loyalty rewards, our incentivizations, and our sponsored content. A user in Miami is able to earn loyalty reward points that are issued by both Cubic and the Transit Authority. But I can also, as a user, augment my points that I earn from behavior modifications by way of engaging with third-party sponsored content. Now, once I've, as a user, I've earned enough loyalty points, let's say I've earned a thousand loyalty points, that equates to about five US dollars, I'd be able to cash that in in Miami and I can actually get myself a free one day ticket to ride on Miami transportation. However, unlike with most loyalty programs, when I redeem my loyalty points and the fee that I'm redeeming them for has to take a loss or a discount on that, that's not the case for our solution that we have with Miami. In fact, what happens in Miami is when I'm redeeming for that one day pick ticket, one day all day pass, I'm ecstatic as a user because I get to ride on Miami Transit for free. And Miami's happy too, because we actually write to Miami a check for the full value of that ticket. So if I got a $5 ticket, Miami's getting a check in the mail for $5. But because we actually have set this up in Miami for them to make money off of this by way of the sponsored content, in addition to the getting a check back in the mail for five, five bucks, we also write Miami a check for any revenue share that's generated from this third party sponsored content. So what we have with Miami is a loyalty rewards and incentivization platform that ultimately isn't costing Miami anything and in fact is the exact opposite and it's actually driving revenue from direct sponsor content. And that doesn't even take into consideration the behavior modifications that Miami is going to be able to benefit from our platform. Which takes us to our final slide. The core of what is Cubic Interactive is this incentivization tool. The ability to incentivize riders to modify their travel behaviors that best benefits the needs of the transit partners with whom we work with. If, for example, we want to incentivize people to come back to transit because they haven't ridden it for the last 30 to 60 days clear use case in the world in which we live in right now, I think it's very safe to say that a significant number of our transit riders that had typically taken transit, they've not done so in the last couple of months because of COVID. We can figure out who those people are, we can communicate to them, and we can issue them an incentive to bring them back. If we want to incentivize people to buy a particular product or pass, we can incentivize them. Effectively, we can create an incentive for anything we ultimately want in conjunction with our transit partners, so long as we have data that ultimately allows us to mine and determine who is eligible and who is ultimately performed the necessary desired behavior modifications that they would ultimately be able to then in turn earn their loyalty points. And although this isn't a behavior modification or an incentive, our platform is even capable of supporting train delays. So if, for example, buses, so if, for example, we've noticed that a, a transit rider's vehicle has become delayed, we can leverage our platform to issue out a couple of reward points as an apology on behalf of the transit authority. However, the key use case that we really have on deck for us today is shifting the peak. And this is a use case that is very important in this day and age of COVID where we have to help one another socially distance. Socially distance is the key message that we all hear from public health officials around the world. Transit authorities are operating their vehicles at near 100% capacity, and in some cases at 100% capacity, but to adhere to social distancing guidelines, they can allow those vehicles to run at full occupancy. They have to, at some point, stop individuals from getting on those buses and those trains which as we start to see ridership increase, which inevitably we will, these transit authorities and our partners that we're working with are presented with a rather interesting and unfortunate problem that they're gonna have to start leaving people behind. I'm sorry, our bus is full, we're at capacity, we can't leave, let you on, please wait for the next bus. So let's assume that we want to incentivize people to take a different bus. So let's say the number 13 bus route, we know that that bus is seeing a rise in, in ridership, but it's at capacity, and the 8 a.m. bus is particularly busy. However, the 7.45 a.m. bus isn't. It's got spare room. So we want to create a loyalty campaign event. 
and we want to send this out to a maximum of a thousand people. That is, we want to incentivize a maximum of a thousand people to take us up on this incentive offer. And we're going to issue anyone who does 100 loyalty points. And we want to run this for a week. So we'll then look at all the data of users and transit riders who typically take the 8 a.m. bus and we'll create a score, a propensity that as to how they ultimately will react in a positive or a negative manner to an incentive that comes from Cubic Interactive. And we'll then target a subset of those users. Let's say we find 100 people and we'll send it out to 10 people because of course we don't want everyone to take us up on the offer. Otherwise, we just shifted the problem from the 8 a.m. bus to the 7.40 to 5 a.m. bus. So we'll send it to 10 people and we'll then monitor their, their behavior and anyone who takes us up on this incentive and rides the 7.45 a.m. bus, we'll issue them out their loyalty rewards. And then when we repeat the process the following day, we'll learn. We'll learn from how people reacted positively, negatively, to the incentive and then of course we'll also take into consideration any new transit riders that have come into the equation within the last 24 hours and we'll rescore the lot of them and then we'll repeat and we'll resend it out the campaign and we'll continue to do so until we've hit our desired milestones which is either we've shifted in this instance a thousand people to that 7:45 a.m bus or we've run out the clock on the week time frame a key, a key point as I near the end of my section is we've very much built the Cubic Interactive platform to be able to support any transit agency in the world. Our APIs can plug into any front end experience, may that be a web app, a mobile app, a back office, and it doesn't need or you don't need to be an existing Cubic customer to leverage the capabilities. We've also designed this as a platform to be extremely economical from a pricing perspective. If we layer on top our sponsored content, the Cubic Interactive platform can self-fund, allowing a transit agency to, at worst case, deploy these solutions and these incentivizations at a cost-neutral price point. But if we do what we've done in Miami, the Cubic Interactive platform can actually become a revenue driver, a revenue opportunity for any partner that we work with. So that's my time. I believe we are now on the Q&A section. I'll hand it over to Sam. Thank you, Robert. And thank you to all of our speakers today for their excellent presentations. We now have the pleasure to introduce our question and answer session, where today's speakers are available to answer your questions. Don't forget, you can still submit your questions using the questions panel in the menu on the right. So without further ado, let's take a look at our first question. And today's first question is for Bonnie. And the question is, in the graphs that you went through, showing the different travel modes and recovery, is there any sense of what bike share and ride share looks like? That's a great question. Yes. So we're certainly seeing that as people are looking to get out into the open air, that bike share has recovered more quickly from an active mobility perspective than ride share. Certainly ride share providers have been doing their part to implement um, measures and mask wearing and, uh, and other types of uh, contact tracing, uh, but we are seeing a significant increase in uh, the use of bike share in micro mobility such as scooters um, and we're really encouraged by that as it really showcases that that first and last mile opportunity which we want to be able to bring together for that look book and pay experience um, for riders of transport around the world um, will rely heavily on the bike share and the micro mobility as we go forward and we bring riders to tr public transport and then away from public transport uh, to their final destinations. Great, thank you. Our next question is for Frank. What data is available and from what sources that can give insight on capacity reach on transit? How can we see in real time actual passenger loads so operators and passengers can maintain social distancing? Yeah, 
Yep, that's uh, that's a really good question as well. So there, there's a couple ways. Um, first of all, several agencies around the world are now starting to include uh, crowded um, uh, crowded uh, levels in their um, coming from their automated passenger counters and putting this into their real time GTFS feeds. If you're familiar with GTFS. So at Move It, we're able to then take that information coming from basically the vehicles and then expose that out to the riders. Uh, the other way is that Move It has a, a huge um, number of what we call Move Iters that, that basically contribute information into uh, the, the Move It user experience. So uh, our um, basically our crowdsourcing capabilities where users can actually share that among the ridership uh, is another way that, uh, that that's occurring today. So that's, uh, that's the answer to that question. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Our next question is for Robert. What can people use their reward points for and what are those at cost? Yeah, so we want to drive people back to transit. So one of the reasons why we like to do an integration into the back office with our transit partners is it allows us, as is the case in Miami, to allow tickets and fare value to be a redemption option for the transit riders. Um, it's actually turned out to be extremely successful in Miami in that people genuinely do want and need free transit, but they have no other means of, of doing so or they, you know, they don't want to pay for it, but the loyalty points allows them to do so. We are also expanding our redemption catalog to allow people to place their loyalty points in exchange for, well, they can cash them in basically and put them into cash onto a virtual NFC rewards card that will sit in my Apple phone, Google phone, et cetera, and I can spend it anywhere MasterCard is accepted. Effectively, it's cash. Uh, what they cost to the transit operator is nothing. So whenever a loyalty point is issued, if it's a cubic loyalty point, um, when we can support both a cubic loyalty point or a transit agency loyalty point, um, the liability really depends on who owns that lo loyalty point. If it's cubic owned, the liability, the financial liability actually sits with cubic. And in that sense, once that's sitting there, it has no cost to the transit authority. And when it's redeemed for a transit authority ticket, like I said, we pay that transit authority for the full fair value of whatever it is that user is redeeming their points for. Okay, thank you. And I believe we have a follow-up question to the, that question. Can loyalty points also be earned using microtransit and bike share partners? Yeah, absolutely. There's no limitation. Um, all, all, at the end of the day, where and how an individual can earn loyalty points is really going to be done in conjunction with our, our transit partners. If a transit partner wishes us to allow for a user to earn points on other modes of travel beyond uh, bus, train, um, et cetera, then it's simply a matter of data and us creating the business rules. As a platform, we can support the issuance of loyalty points for really anything. And I'll just add that that's really important because in this, in this day and age of trying to help with mode shift, get people out of single occupancy vehicles into public transit, offering you know other ways to do that and encourage that behavior and then measure that over time, how effective you know, initiatives have been to try to incent that behavior. You know, the Cubic Interactive platform is completely aligned to that. Right, and we, relating to that question, we actually have a question for Bonnie. What can transit and mobility operators do to ensure that car usage and car ownership does not increase? That's a great question as well. I think one of the most important things that we can be doing is um, you know, taking a lead from what we're seeing in Paris, we are um, experiencing a unique time where from a safety perspective, people are looking to increase their usage potentially of those single occupancy vehicles and putting in the congestion management and really looking at this from a not just a climate perspective but also then leveraging things like the incentivization um, to shift riders um, from their private vehicles into a transport vehicle utilizing micro mobility or bike share uh, to get them to do that first mile and last mile um, out in the open air which of course we're seeing is um, helping not just from a 
climate perspective, but also from a, a health and wellness and keeping people, um, you know, in an outside area rather than uh, more of a confined inside area. So I think putting all of those things together and looking at it as a total platform solution for your transport riders is really going to be key to um, it, keeping those single occupancy vehicles off of the road and bringing riders back to public transport. Because if we've seen any Anything through this crisis, it is that our riders around the world really do rely on the essential nature of public transport. And now is the time to put those things back into place to encourage them to feel safe and, and comfortable getting back on the vehicles that we're all providing. Great, thank you, Bonnie. And our next question is for Frank and Robert. Agencies of every size need data to better manage their operations and efficiency. Can even a smaller agency of, say, 50 buses use a program like Interactive or Move It? Do right, you want to start? Sure, yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, there, there's no limits in terms of agency size. So we're working with agencies really of, of all sizes from, you know, 50 vehicles and up. So I think you know, the points that we're discussing today can be implemented and, and support uh, agencies that are, you know, thinking of mobility first, really regardless of, of, of their size and location for that matter. Robert, do you want to add to that? Yeah, no, absolutely mirroring what Frank said, even from a Cubic Interactive perspective, uh, given that we are a platform SaaS based, it doesn't matter if you've got one bus, bus or 20,000 buses, um, our, our tools and platform can absolutely be deployed for any transit authority. And I, I think also, you know, the ability in larger metropolitan areas where there's multiple agencies that have to interact, there's also a lot of value that together we, we bring there as well. And one understanding kind of the requirements in looking at the data and analytics between various agencies and helping where they're working together to transport people around the, the city uh, and also to you know incent incent the right behavior in that regard. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna um, jump in as well because I I think that from a platform perspective, that's one of the most powerful things of bringing a platform. Um, together with all of the different components, with the incentivization of Cubic Interactive, with the data and journey planning of Move It, and then with the um, mobile first contactless technology from a fair management perspective. Because by putting that into your hands at a smaller level, a one bus, 10 bus, 50 bus, it allows you to then grow as your ridership grows and as your city or metropolitan region grows. Um, so there are a lot of really interesting things that you can do by bringing all of those technologies together. Yep. And um, on the data side, just to add, it's, it's obviously extremely important in this day and age that we're adhering to certain privacy and data protection rules and laws. Uh, and adhering to GDPR, even if you're not necessarily governed by GDPR, is certainly a good mandate to, to follow. And from our perspective, at least from Cubic Interactive perspective, and I'm sure um, move it as well in the rest of Cubic, we obviously are very mindful of, of these legalities and ensuring that a user has to opt in in order for us to appropriately track them. And if they do opt out, then their data is immediately removed. If I can add just one other thought, the uh, other trend that we've seen is, you know, the increasing introduction of micro transit services into an agency or a city's uh, you know set of mobility options and if you think of uh, a smaller agency we've seen some of them completely looking at more of an on-demand type service or at least complementing fixed route service so when you have a platform that that can expose and make your ridership aware of all the available options uh, you know, it's just a better experience for them. They're aware of things they didn't even know existed before, and it starts to give a lot more flexibility and choice and and, and really encourage people to come back and use public transit uh, even more than they did perhaps in, in the past because it's a lot more convenient, a lot more flexible and adaptive to what you know you uh, you personally prefer to do in terms of your 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 daily choice in getting around town. Okay, great, thank you. We now have a question open to the floor. 
what features can be added to existing public transit apps that would enhance their functionality and better serve their riders? I'll, I'll go ahead and start on that. I think that, you know, one of the things that we've seen, and Frank alluded to this a little bit earlier, is that capacity uh, capability. So being able to bring in, um, even if it's something as simple as a red, yellow, green, my bus is extremely crowded, my train is, uh, is you know, partly open, or um, it's, uh, it's fairly um, clear and social distancing can be actively enforced. I think that's a great feature. I also think that really moving people to a mobile uh, first strategy from a payment perspective so that they're not needing to interact with cash or uh, with a, a TVM or with an agent, for example, uh, where they would have to have that contact is something um, that could be added. And then finally, I would say that people are looking for information. And so being able to provide them with uh, community-based content, with communication tools for rider engagement, allows them to better interact with you as the transit uh, provider for them, um, whether that's as an agency or as a private um, active mobility or micro mobility provider, it's going to allow you to interact with your riders in a way that keeps them engaged and, and also starts to bring uh, them back to the transport. Yeah, I think just to add to that, it's all about, there's a lot of opportunities to improve the whole experience and, and make it very convenient. And I, I, I really believe like that personal personalization aspect of what, what apps can bring to, to all of us is, is very important. So to learn again, you know, what is my preference, Frank, as a, as a traveler um, to use, you know, a platform that can incent and encourage behavior is important. I think there's a lot of work still to be done on the whole integrated journey planning and, and, and fair payment. Uh, when you look at incorporating multiple modes in most of our, you know, local ecosystems in our cities, you know, there could be very different uh, sets of uh, mobility operators. And so there's a lot of work that we're doing in combination with Cubic to try to bring that together. So not only pay for your public transportation, but potentially other modes of mobility that help get you to the grid, such as a you know bike share, and in, and show when I do a search and a trip plan, here's a multimodal journey that can get you from here to there. So still more work to be done there, but I think uh, all of us in the community that are working on this together, it's kind of getting better and better, you know, e each day. Okay, great, thank you. Our next question is for Robert. What are some additional use cases for incentives? Can you target riders that haven't used the system over a defined period of time and encourage them to come back to transit? Yeah, but I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, we can create any kind of incentive. It just depends on what kind of data we ultimately have access to. So if um, come back to transit is absolutely one of the key, key use cases that we have in our platform. We've noticed you haven't ridden the transit system in the last 30 to 60 days. Uh, absolutely, we can send an incentive to those individuals and see who ultimately responds and go through the same uh, checks and balances as we did in that use case that I walked through where we score the propensity of individuals to respond. But everything from buying a particular ticket to product to um, changing even the direction and modes of travel, if we do want to incentivize people to do a bike share versus a, um, a bus because of whatever reason, maybe the bus is delayed or traffic in the city is highly congested today. Um, our platform is even also capable of expanding outside of public transit. It can support uh, incentivizations for roadways. So if you want to incentivize a driver maybe to not leave their house at a particular time of day because we know the roads will be congested, our platform can support that. If you want the driver to take an alternative route due to construction, the platform can support that. Okay, thank you. Our next question is, Paris has been focused on promotional alternatives to SOVs, and that has been a great driver for public transit and micromobility use. What policy changes should agencies consider to bring back riders? I think that one of the things that is really interesting, and certainly we've seen it in Paris as well as in other cities around the world, is um, 
the demand management and the, the traffic management of the flow of vehicles in and out of a city. So working with your city or uh, metro governments to manage how the, the traffic is flowing and to provide whether it's a incentive or a penalty for single occupancy vehicles in and out of the city during you know peak times for example to focus people back towards the transport systems as well as then combined with the incentivization scheme to allow them to come back into the public transport modes and i think that's something that um, certainly from a um, effectiveness perspective and a policy perspective we've seen work quite well in places like paris and others Okay, thank you. Our next question is, can we please have the details to request a consultation or a POC? Yeah, yeah I think to. all the details are on your screen and also will be sent in the follow-up uh, for people who've attended the webinar today. Okay, great, thank you. And we have a question for Frank. Let's talk about data privacy and data ownership. What are the gold standards in terms of measures that are taken to ensure personal data is not shared or used inappropriately? Sure, sure. So uh, in terms of MoveIt's um, protection of, of data, you know, we're a fully GDPR compliant system. So for example, when I talked about the data that we collect, we collect anonymous data aggregated data about how people move in and around the cities. So data privacy is a is of utmost importance to us uh, and we take that very seriously. So all of our, again, all of our systems and our platform ad adhere to that. And we use that globally. So although GDPR, you know, is a is a standard that originated in Europe, uh, it's it's been implemented uh, in the Move It environment all around the world. Okay, thank you, Frank. And we have another question for Robert. Why is it better to do a hyper-targeted travel behavior campaign versus something with more broad reach to all travelers? And can you exactly explain what a hyper-targeted campaign is? Yeah, a hyper-targeted campaign would be something that specifically targets a subset of the users. So in that example where I said we want to shift a thousand people from the number 13 bus and we know that a hundred people ride that bus every day, we sent it to all 100 people and all 100 people acted upon that incentive, we would have just shifted the problem, not the people. The people would have shifted all to the 7.45 a.m. bus, so all so the 7.45 a.m. bus would now be crowded and wouldn't allow for social distancing or uh, a flattening of, of the peak. So we want to make sure that when we do send out an incentive, we're not sending it out to the entire population, but we're sending it out to a subset of users so that we can change the behaviors and then impact the whatever it is we want to impact whether it be a social political economic um, motivated behavior modification great thank you and next question is for cubic interactive would local businesses be able to participate in advertising or by offering local incentives such as free desserts at a restaurant to riders yeah, absolutely. So one of the technologies that we do have uh, planned for our platform is something called card linked offers. So that effectively allows an individual to link their credit card, debit card to the Cubic Interactive platform. And when I show up at, let's call it Starbucks, and I spend $5, there might have been an offer in the system that says spend $5, earn 100 loyalty points. So by way of me having used my Visa credit card to buy that cup of coffee, spent the $5, pounds, whatever it happens to be, I would have earned my loyalty points. And instead of that turning into a statement credit, which yes, it does benefit the user, it does no benefit to the transit agency. So by us converting that reward into a loyalty point, which goes back into the transit agency, we're trying to create this 360 experience where users spend money on transit, they go and spend money within their local community, and they ultimately can come back and spend that money back with the transit authorities. Uh, so yeah, very much our platform is designed to allow for a individual to earn 
loyalty points outside of the transit system, spend them on the transit system. But also at the same time, in that same example, if I do have a thousand loyalty points and I want to, I, for whatever reason, I actually don't feel like I want to put that onto a, a ticket for the day. I would actually would need that money onto a virtual rewards card. I can put that onto my card and I can then spend that money in the local community. Um, and local community members as part of this platform can go into the system and create these incentives that drive foot traffic to their physical locations. Great, thank you, Robert. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Most transport agencies are strapped for cash right now due to reduced fare box revenue. What are the options for funding incentives program? Yeah, so that's the that's where the sponsorships can come into play. So Miami, um, similar situation, um, like with any transit agency in, in the world, right? Ridership is down exponentially. They still want to issue out incentives and loyalty points, but paying for it's a challenge. So that's where we work with third-party brands and sponsors, and they ultimately through a user's engagement with this brand brand content that funds the loyalty points that are issued out. And when a individual engages in this content, it obviously generates revenue for, for us collectively. And on the revenue share that a transit agency gets from Cubic on this brand content engagement, the transit agency has two choices. They can convert any excess revenue back into loyalty points so that they can issue out more incentives or you can actually cash out and turn it into the revenue generating tool. So it's, it, it ultimately becomes a choice, a philosophical choice or business choice with the transit agency, whether they wish to use the excess funds that come from the brands, from the sponsors to pay for more loyalty incentives or whether they want to put that into, uh, in, back into the bank account. But our platform can be leveraged in a manner that, has all of the loyalty incentives paid for by a third party brand. Thank you. And our next question is, once an agency has the data analyzed to understand their new rider travel patterns, what measures or tactics can be used to shift travel behavior to less busy times, for example? Uh, to start with the interactive, an easy one would be obviously leveraging the Cubic Interactive platform. So if we have a lot of, if we have a decent understanding of how people are using the transit system, we know where the choke points are, what times of day, which particular routes, buses, vehicles, whatever it happens to be, we can take all that data, ingest it into the Cubic Interactive platform, and then through our incentivizations, help modify the user behavior. Yeah, an example of that. So imagine you're, you know, you're in the app and, you know, you're looking at your options, or maybe you have a favorite line that you take every day and it basically would say, hey, um, you know, this this bus is is crowded. If you wait to, to the next bus, which is 20% capacity, we're going to give you an incentive, maybe a free ride, uh, you know, on the weekend or or another incentive. Uh, so, you know, there's ways that, you know, from a tactic point of view, you can prioritize when people are doing a a, a trip plan or or basically looking at when their next bus is arriving to direct them. Uh, or at least offer the option for them to take, you know, another uh, another ride at another time, for example. Okay, great. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. We will do our best to answer the remaining questions after the webinar. As you can see on your screen, and as mentioned in the Q&A, the team has prepared a limited time offer for all attendees today, reflecting a free consultation. Further information is available upon request after the webinar. Please join me in thanking Robert, Frank and Bonnie for their time today, an excellent series of presentations and Q&A session. As you leave the webinar today, a survey will appear on your screen asking you to rate the webinar. Please take a moment to provide your feedback. If now is not a good time, the survey will be sent to you shortly via email. If you could complete it when you can, we would greatly appreciate it. On behalf of Intelligent Transport, Cubic and Moveit, I would like to thank you all for attending today. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. Thank you.